My name is Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983. Um, and we talk about a lot of different things, history, politics, um, lots of different themes that we have each semester. But this semester, we're f highlighting our newer faculty and staff, people who are new to campus, a lot of whom uh, came during the pandemic. So being able to get out in the public and, and talk to folks like you is something that is that they haven't been able to do for a bit. So we really appreciate um, you attending today. And I will go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Andrew is an assistant professor of bilingual, bicultural education and English as a second language at UW-Whitewater. He received his PhD in curriculum and instruction from the University of Texas at Austin. His dissertation, Sustaining Bilingual Education Amidst School Choice Expansion and Linguistic Dispossession, won the 2020 Council on Anthropology and Education's Frederick Erickson Outstanding Dissertation Award. Award, as well as the Wilga Rivers 2020 Graduate Student Award from the American Association for Applied Linguistics. Before moving to Austin for graduate school, Andrew worked as a teacher assistant, bilingual teacher, and school administrator at a bilingual school on Milwaukee's near north side. Andrew lives in Milwaukee with his wife and child, and he is anxiously awaiting spring to see if the shade-loving native plants he planted last fall have survived the adorable yet voracious bunnies that live in his yard. Please welcome Andrew Heary. Hello, everybody. Can can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for welcoming me into uh, Fairhaven. I am used to giving these kinds of talks at kind of esoteric academic conferences. And so there's often panelists. There's about, you know, five panelists and usually like two people in the audience. And, and so then we'll like present to each other. And so this is a very uh, <laughs> wonderful crowd and, and I appreciate you giving up your time to, uh, to spend here and, and listen to me talk for a while. Um, I'm also interested in, you know, your experiences, and so we'll have a time at the end for some uh, conversation and dialogue and questions and answers. And so uh, before I get into the slides, I have a presentation, and you can see here the title of my talk today is Bilingual Education and School Privatization in Milwaukee. Um, but before I get into the slides, I'm just curious uh, kind of who's in the room. So if you could raise your hand, how many of you would uh, consider yourself bilingual? <laughs> we got a, a couple hands, okay. All right, yeah, a couple people, okay, great. Um, how many of you attended public schools in K-12? All right, so a lot more, a lot more people. How many of you attended private schools at some point in your K-12 education? So fewer hands, all right. So my talk today is gonna kind of get into all of those issues and how they kind of work out in complicated ways within the context of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And while Milwaukee has a rich history of bilingual education um, with uh, other European languages like uh, say German, you know, Milwaukee was very important and then uh, had innovative uh, German English bilingual programs. Um, as well as the complicated legacy of kind of anti-indigenous uh, language uh, programs and the rich bilingual traditions of Native American and in indigenous groups um, throughout uh, the country. My talk really focuses on Spanish-English bilingual education. Right? And so kind of when I refer to uh, bilingual education within this talk, it's shorthand for Spanish English bilingual education. And you know, Spanish has a unique um, status in this country as uh, you know, a, a European colonial language, but also as a minoritized and um, 
uh, kind of discriminated language. So it's kind of, it's this uh, kind of contentious status. And so that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about today within the context of Milwaukee, all right? So to give you a little um, overview of the presentation, I'll first talk about how I came to this work. I think that that's important for you all to um, have an idea of you know, who I am. Uh, and we all have our kind of scholarly interests, those of us who kind of stand up and talk in front of uh, people. But I think it's important to also get a sense of um, what experiences have informed this work and, and kind of what um, uh, life opportunities I've had, and, because that is a lens through which I come to this work, all right? And then I'll talk about some background for uh, kind of like a broader context of Spanish-English bilingual education in this country, and then get into the Milwaukee context specifically, looking at the roots of bilingual education in Milwaukee, and then school privatization. So there's um, if, how many of you have heard of uh, the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program and uh, School Voucher Program? Yeah, so uh, very, uh, several of you have heard about that. So I'm gonna talk about that and charter schools and kind of the, the effects of these school privatization policies on bilingual education in the city. All right, and then we'll, we should have time for questions and answers and, and discussion uh, if I don't get too windy with my slides. Um, oh, I should say that, what's that, that notebook page there? Um, that is a picture of uh, some notes that I took when I was in my, going into my third year of being a bilingual teacher at a bilingual charter school on Milwaukee's near south side. And this seems to be floating away, so <laughs> hopefully it can stay put. Can you still hear me okay? Okay, all right, great. So this um, was, was based on a professional development session at the beginning of the school year when I was going into my third year as a teacher. And it was just such a dynamic and important uh, experience for me because the guest was Tony Bias, who um, is, you know, synonymous with bilingual education in the city and the country and internationally. He's been um, really an important figure in uh, creating and uh, expanding bilingual education programs. And so he talked about the history of bilingual education. And, you know, I took pages of notes and it was really helpful for me as a teacher. You know, in my, going into my third year, I was feeling isolated and, you know, kind of alone in my classroom, and I had a bunch of questions. And this talk that uh, Dr. Bias gave helped me to see my work, you know, not just as an isolated classroom, but as part of something much bigger, all right? And so I understood also that, you know, my work was in some small way contributing to that uh, broader legacy, and also that bilingual education in this context really wasn't for me, that I could be a part of it, um, but for me as a white person who learned Spanish later on in life, um, really bilingual education, Spanish-English bilingual education was, was really meant uh, to be a, a Latinx or Latina, Latino-led movement for self-determination. And so um, this was a really important experience for me that kind of informed uh, my later work. So um, speaking of my work at the school, you can see me with uh, Miss De La Rosa, who was a teacher assistant there. I was in my first year as a teacher, and you know she she was the teacher. You know she had many more years of experience, and and she really had a a, a beautiful way of working with with kids. Um, but that was me in my first year of teaching, kind of struggling through and trying to figure things out. Uh, but I stayed at this school on Milwaukee's near South Side, and. Um, you know, most, the vast majority of uh, families were from, uh, of Mexican origin or Puerto Rican origin. And it was a bilingual school. So, you know, teaching Spanish and English. And 
I became a school administrator of the school's fine arts and STEM program, so STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And there were a lot of vibrant things that were going on, as you can see in a couple of the pictures. So this mural is called El Poder de las Palabras, The Power of Words, and it was made by students in conjunction with a community artist, um, Ras Amar, Nisa Roma. Uh, he was, he, he, if anybody has been to Milwaukee going down uh, Highway 43 near downtown, there's um, a mural of Joshua Glover and uh, you know the Underground Railroad. Um, so he was the artist who did that mural and he worked with students at La Causa, where I worked, uh, to make that, uh, this mural here. The students would perform, they would uh, dance, they would play music, they would sing, they would go all around the city at different locations and, and perform. And so this was rich, meaningful learning that I saw going on at the school. And it was inspiring and I really um, was uh, happy to be a part of it and grateful to be a part of it. Um, at the same time, there were other things happening at the, at the school. Uh, things that I saw in terms of teacher turnover. And what I noticed was that many of the teachers who left in one or two years were white teachers who uh, spoke only English and kind of went to the suburbs as kind of their goal, right? So they, they were there for a couple years and then they left. Um, in addition, there was uh, this really kind of emphasis on standardized testing and kind of a concomitant like um, irrelevance in some of the curriculum, right? Because it was like test prep, test prep. And so these were tensions that I saw at the school. There was, you know, some great teachers, great things going on, teaching and learning, but then there were these other patterns that I saw and uh, wanted to study as uh, part of my dissertation, which I'm going to share. And some of this I've, I've continued since completing my dissertation um, in 2020. So for the purposes of this talk, I have kind of two questions to consider. One, how did Spanish English bilingual education begin in Milwaukee? So that's one. And then how has school privatization affected bilingual education in the city? So those are kind of the two guiding questions that I'll explore throughout the talk today. And you know, I've been fortunate um, to sit down and learn from some people who were central in the movement to launch and sustain bilingual education. And so I'll draw from the, the interviews, the oral history interviews that I did. Um, but uh, these uh, three people in particular, uh, I'm gonna refer back to. So I already mentioned, uh, Luis Antonio Tony Baez, um, and you know he's really been a central figure. So here they they appear in alphabetical order. So uh, Tony Baez, he you, you can look him up online. He's he's been to many places and done many things, but he's been central to the movement for bilingual education. His activism started in the Puerto Rican liberation movement. Um, he was a, a very important figure in civil rights struggles and desegregation struggles in Milwaukee. He earned his PhD from uh, UW Milwaukee, and you know he's held a, a, a number of positions. He was uh, provost at MATC, dean at uh, Ostos Bilingual College in New York, and most recently he was a school board member uh, on the M Milwaukee Public Schools School Board. All right, so, you know, very active, remains active, and um, an important person who's really been central to the movement for bilingual education. Uh, the second photo there is Graciela de la Cruz. She is the, the woman who appears in the middle of the, the mural there. And that's a mural on Milwaukee's near south side. It's just around the corner from the school that I used to work at. Uh, it was made by a UWM art professor and his art students. Um, and she is there representing this kind of tra trajectory of um, 
you know, access to education and scholarship and bilingual teaching. So she was one of the first bilingual teachers in Milwaukee, and she was very active and became a teacher leader, studied educational administration, and decided not to go that route because she had more agency and more room to, um, to, to question as a teacher rather than as a principal. And you know she's uh, very been been very active in Mexican Fiesta and a lot of different other um, organizations around Milwaukee. Uh, and she completed advanced coursework at UWM, uh, UW Milwaukee. And Marta Lamelas, the the last person you see there. Um, she was one of the first bilingual guidance counselors in Milwaukee public schools. And so she started as a, a, a Spanish teacher, and then as the bilingual program was kind of growing, they recognized that there was a need not only for bilingual classroom teachers, but support staff. And so the district a actually supported her in studying school counseling and becoming one of the first guidance counselors in the district um, to, to, you know, to serve in a bilingual program in bilingual capacity. And so she's been on a lot of different boards around the state uh, and national boards. Uh, so she served on the WIDA board, which has to do with language acquisition, uh, the Wisconsin Association for Bilingual Education, WIABE, the, the board, as well as the Equal Rights Commission. So these are, um, you know, people who have done a lot, and uh, I've, I, it's uh, been really a privilege to hear their stories. And so I hope that my telling of them today will uh, do them justice. Um, so in terms of some just background about bilingual education, we might think, you know, uh, teaching in two languages, that's bilingual education, right? Um, but there's a couple different models of bilingual education, and I think it's helpful just to contextualize this whole conversation. Uh, so what you see there in blue are the three kind of types of bilingual models that, that I'll talk about. And then below is kind of the goals of those different programs, right? So a transitional bilingual model is one that uses a little bit of uh, Spanish or a language other than English to get the students as quickly as they can to English. Right, so the goal really of transitional programs is English acquisition, right? And, and so that's kind of the logic that guides transitional models. And it's, it's really kind of this assimilatory version where, you know, students who speak languages other than English need to get to English as fast as they can, all right? Now, Different from that model is the developmental model and then later this two-way model. But a developmental bilingual model is kind of how it sounds, right? It's um, a model that seeks to sustain the student's bilingualism. So rather than say, hey, kids, you got to get to English as fast as you can, and English is the most important language, a developmental model says, Learning English is a process, but we don't want you to stop learning content and just focus on acquiring English. So we're going to teach in two languages, and we want to nurture your bilingualism. We want you to be bilingual individuals and biliterate individuals, and we want you to learn to write in two languages and speak about a range of topics in two different languages. Right? So that's kind of the, the middle model there. And then two-way models, if we you know, want to make a division so clearly, two-way models really um, came about a little bit later and they uh, roughly are saying, we're gonna mix groups of children from different linguistic backgrounds 
and they're going to learn from each other. So, um, you know, English speaking students from English speaking households are going to uh, meet with um, Chinese speaking students, Mandarin speaking students, and they're going to learn from each other. Or, um, you know, Spanish speaking students from Spanish speaking households and English speaking households are going to meet and they're going to learn from each other. And so that's the, the two way model. And it gets more complicated than that, but um, I think that just kind of this, um, this framework can be helpful to understand why Milwaukee's history is unique and important, all right? So in terms of those models, there are some important court cases and laws at the national level that kind of help frame what happened in Milwaukee in particular, right? So there's a lot of different court cases. There's a lot of different court cases. We can talk about, um, you know, uh, Mendes versus Westminster, which was uh, a case that um, sought to uh, get rid of racial segregation and, and, and um, segregation of Latinx students uh, from white students in California. That was a precursor to the Brown v. Board. How many of us have heard of the, the Brown v. Board? Uh, so, you know, a very consequential desegregation case. Mendes versus Westminster came before that. Right, and that was kind of a, a precedent for the Brown v. Board. Um, so there, there's a lot of different court cases, but um, one that I'll talk to today, uh, one that I'll highlight is Lau v. Nichols. Um, and before that, the Bilingual Education Act. So that was national legislation, federal legislation, that basically uh, brought support and additional resources for bilingual education. Now, it um, it was a contentious process, as you can imagine, right? There, there were grassroots activists, movements going on all around the country in support of bilingual education. And these were Latinx-led movements. Um, Eventually, after negotiations and um, kind of concessions and, and changing the language of the Bilingual Education Act, uh, it won bipartisan support, and it was reluctantly signed by Lind Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1968, all right? So um, it's an important uh, piece of legislation, but as the uh, education historian Guadalupe San Miguel explains, the Bilingual Education Act was, quote, programmatically small, categorical in nature, compensatory in intent, and voluntary, right, end quote. So it started small. It was just a little bit of money, and it was voluntary. But at the same time, it offered grants to schools and school districts to start bilingual education programs. Now, there were states that, and districts that were doing this, you know, uh, lots of states um, in, you know, in the Southwest, particularly in California and New Mexico and in Texas, there's this legacy of Spanish English bilingual education. This national legislation um, supported that work, and it also opened up possibilities for expanding bilingual education in places like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? Uh, Lau v. Nichols, that was a court case, very important court case, um, that is often said to kind of uh, support bilingual education um, as a practice for students from um, homes that don't, uh, that speak languages other than English, right? And so this was a court case in 1974. Uh, the Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court, ruled in favor of the Chinese origin students who were, um, demanding equal access to the curriculum and 
uh, the San Francisco school district basically had been refusing. They said, they get the same materials, it's the same. You know, they, this is fair treatment, this is equal treatment, all right? But the Supreme Court in this kind of often quoted uh, decision said, under these state-imposed standards, there is no equality of treatment merely by providing students with the same facilities, textbooks, teachers, and curriculum. For students who do not understand English are effectively foreclosed from any meaningful education. All right? So that provided further legal support for bilingual education. All right? But uh, at the same time, you know, there are different opinions, <laughs> as you can imagine, right? And, and so Tony Vias argues and, and other folks argue that Lao could have done more. Lao could have mandated bilingual education. And indeed, there were other court cases, uh, for example, in Texas, where they mandated bilingual education. And there were more progressive programs in California and other places. Grassroots activists were demanding more. And Lao basically allowed for bilingual education, but it also allowed for more transitional models and English-only models. And so it has kind of this mixed legacy, but uh, it is an important piece of legislation, uh, legal ruling that um, supported bilingual education to a certain extent. Okay, so those are kind of like some national uh, events going on. And in terms of Milwaukee, in the context of Milwaukee, um, you can see some of the, the mural there. It's important to consider at the, at the end of the 1960s, right, in the middle 1960s, there was a lot going on in terms of um, social activism. There were, um, you know, the farm workers' rights movements, great boycott, um, marches to Madison uh, to demand uh, equal pay for um, workers outside of Allen Bradley, the factory, a cross-racial uh, solidarity march. Um, so there was a lot of activism going on, and bilingual education was also part of this kind of multifaceted activism. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about what the public schooling was like for language minoritized students before bilingual education, right? So another person that I talked to, Esperanza Gutierrez, uh, is a social worker, um, you know, social activist and, and, and very involved. She's done a lot of good things in Milwaukee. She told me the story of how her father took on extra jobs and extra work, and she and her siblings volunteered at a private school and worked at a private school in order to afford tuition because her father knew that the practice in the public schools was to channel students who spoke Spanish into what they called special C. Right? So special C is um, maybe today's equivalent of special education, right? And so, you know, special education can be a really important uh, set of supports for students identified with disabilities. My wife is a speech language pathologist, bilingual speech language pathologist in Milwaukee. And um, I see the potential of special education and th its importance. but. In this practice, special education was this very remedial and exclusionary placement. And so Esperanza Gutierrez and her father knew that the private school where she went would be somewhat of a refuge, right? She wouldn't automatically be funneled into this special C just because she spoke Spanish at home, right? But that was a practice, 
okay? And um, along with that, there were increasing numbers of uh, students entering the Milwaukee Public Schools uh, from Mexico, from Puerto Rico, uh, from Texas in, in Spanish-speaking families. And most of them went into the public schools, right? And so there was kind of this recognition that there were uh, there was some demographic shifts going on in the public schools, and so they needed to do something. So Tony Vias tells this story about a professional development session, and I'll let him tell it because um, you know he's he's very funny, <laughs> and he he you know has a has a great uh, gift for storytelling. So this is a professional development project workshop that they did for teachers at this school with an increasing number of. Uh, Puerto Rican students. Example, there was a school in Jackson at that time in 1960, about 66 or 67, that had so many Puerto Rican kids that they had to bring in a psychologist to meet before the teachers to tell them, to give them a, a PD, a professional development, of what to do with these Puerto Rican kids, you know, where they came from the island and all of that. And then he showed them a movie. Mm. That's in the records of MPS. And I laughed when I saw what they did because they saw this movie and then they had this commentary about the movie. Guess what movie it was? In the 60s, they showed them a side story. And there was a West side story that they analyzed how these poor Rican kids behave and all of that mm. kind of stuff. And, uh, so that triggered a bunch of concerns and those people in the area were like, what the heck, West Side Story? <laughs> you know, everybody's going around. Uh, and so there was an outburst in that area, okay? And then there was an outburst here in the near south side. So I'm sorry that that wasn't as uh, as as loud as it, it could be, or as clear as the the recording could be. But um, basically, Dr. Vias is is saying that this professional development session for teachers at this school with increasing numbers of uh, students from Puerto Rico was led by a psychologist, not from the community, who showed West Side Story to the to teachers. And uh, so Tony Vias said, can you imagine everybody going around snapping <laughs> and using West Side Story as a, a, a film to think about the Puerto Rican students' experiences? It was very problematic. And so he said that, that members of the community saw that as a reflection that the schools were just out of touch and, and didn't really understand the needs, the wants, the desires, the aspirations. So he says there was an outburst. And that was on the you know near northeast side of the city. And then he began to talk about another outburst on the near south side where there was a Head Start program, Guadalupe Head Start. And um, they were a group of mothers who were concerned that the bilingual education program in Milwaukee that received federal funding from the Bilingual Education Act, remember I mentioned the Bilingual Education Act? That they, Milwaukee received the grant and it was about to end. And so a group of mothers got together and uh, had an outburst in, in terms of a protest, right? They started to protest to say, we want the district to continue its support for bilingual education, even if the federal money ends, right? And so these two outbursts that Dr. Weiss describes kicked off a lot of sophisticated organizing, right? So there was mobilization, there were meetings, there was a lot of community organizing and planning and protest, and that ended up forming a parent committee, and uh, Dr. Bias was uh, the district liaison, so imagine that. The district hired him 
to be a, the bilingual liaison. And there was this very uh, powerful bilingual parent committee that served as the official advisory board to the Milwaukee Public Schools. So in this organizing, in this protests, and um, in this work within the district, they really began to uh, make some positive changes. And Jackson. So in 1974, the district decided to pass a, a developmental program and to approve a developmental model as official board policy, okay? And so this was huge. This was uh, one of the first districts in the country to adopt a developmental model of bilingual education. Other districts saw the Bilingual Education Act and they began to adopt transitional models and to kind of emphasize this idea to get students into English as quick as possible. But Milwaukee and Milwaukee Public Schools passed something different. And it was because of this Latinx-led organizing and the sophisticated political work that the parents did. And also Tony Bias explained that there was a board member who, um, not, not a board member, the acting superintendent that had empathy for uh, what was going on and, and the desires and the demands of the Latinx community. So this is what um, Dr. Bias said. There was a guy that was acting superintendent of the schools by the name of Thiel. Dwight Thiel was of German background and his parents had been dominant in German and had been in bilingual programs in Germany in the 1940s. And so this guy was sympathetic and he didn't fight back. He didn't resist at all, right? So this gentleman had the, really understood the legacy of the cultural erasure and linguistic subtraction of assimilating into whiteness, right? We can see whiteness and this kind of demand that uh, in this country equates whiteness with English and English speaking. And so there was, um, you know, active attempts to stamp out all other languages besides English in this country. And so, you know, Polish immigrants, German immigrants, Welsh immigrants, folks from all over the world were then expected to assimilate into this English-only uh, way of being and lose cultural practices, discontinue cultural practices that marked them as you know, foreigners, quote unquote, right? So this gentleman understood that. He understood his parents' experiences and he supported, he was an advocate and an ally for the Latinx community that was demanding developmental bilingual education, right? There weren't, <laughs> that wasn't everybody on the board. <laughs> you know, there was some very real resistance. Tony Weiss also went on to say, some school board members resisted and they fought back. They did things like turn their backs on me when I was testifying before MPS in protest. We don't want to hear him. He's a radical. He's a communist and blah, blah, blah. And nothing. We won anyway. <laughs> and so you get a sense of like real different reactions, right? This was a contentious project and there was a lot of resistance to it. But in the end, the uh, school district ended up passing developmental bilingual education. Now, once the program started to expand and once there were uh, teachers that were hired, there was also a lot of backlash in terms of English speaking white teachers at the schools. So this is Senora Lamelas 
And remember, she was one of the, uh, the first bilingual guidance counselors in the district. So she told this story of getting a transcript, a student who came from Puerto Rico, all A's, really, you know, top-notch classes. He had studied English in Puerto Rico, so he had a good grasp of English. Um, and so she saw this transcript and she was like, hey, this student can go into this advanced science class. He's ready for it, right? And the uh, English-speaking advanced science teacher went into her office. He was irate. And he said, I don't want him in my class, right? He expected that she was going to take him out, take out the student. And Senora Lamela said, you know, yo le digo, well, I told him, well, if you don't give, if you don't give him two weeks, I'm going to go to the principal. The science teacher didn't want that I rocked the boat. You know what? At the end of the year, he was the best student in his class, best student, right? So there was this male teacher who expected to impose his will and just because he saw the student came from Puerto Rico, he didn't want him in the advanced science class, right? So there was, you know, at the individual level, this expectation that the teacher could impose his will. Uh, and kind of at the programmatic level, there was this kind of funneling of Spanish-speaking students or potentially Spanish-speaking students into more remedial coursework, right? Marta Lamelas' presence was very important in kind of curbing that practice, right? Because she could advocate for the students from her position of being a bilingual guidance counselor. Um, likewise, uh, Senora Graciela um, advocated for not having rigid uh, boundaries between programs. And so, um, she talks here about trying to incorporate the bilingual classes with monolingual classes and having them celebrate together, learn from each other. Um, and so that's a really, uh, I think, important practice to breaking down institutional barriers. So, There's this rich legacy of bilingual education in the city of Milwaukee, and a lot of activism that helped the program to expand over the years. On the other hand, there's this complicated legacy of school privatization measures, right? So we talked about briefly the Milwaukee uh, Parental Choice Program, the school voucher program. It's the longest running um, urban school voucher program in the country, started in 1990, right? And Wisconsin was one of the first states to pass a charter school law. So Minnesota was the first and Wisconsin followed just a couple years afterwards. Um, and so, you know, these are school privatization policies that um, in theory kind of support difference and um, support options and choice. Um, and there's a lot of mixed research on the effects of these policies, right? So one argument is that school choice through charter and voucher schools is a way to improve academic achievement, right? Research suggests that that's not that hasn't happened, you know, since the 90s, right? Academic achievement really has, there's, there's not discernible differences in, you know, public schools and, and uh, charter schools, voucher schools. Um, there's a claim that, um, you know, the parents can uh, kind of vote with their feet and select schools that are good, that um, represent them. Uh, but there's also research that suggests that uh, school choice policies have led to greater segregation, uh, greater racial segregation. They've led to this process of um, schools choosing 
and kind of uh, exiting out students that they deem less desirable, right? So there's this complicated legacy of uh, school privatization policies. And I was interested in kind of how those interact with uh, this legacy of bilingual education. So, um, I don't have a watch here. Oh, yes, I do. Okay, so I'm gonna, you've all been a, a rapt audience. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go uh, briefly through these next slides just because I wanna give us a chance to talk through anything that, that any, any questions or comments that you have. So this is a graph of um, public schools. So the green line is public. This dark blue, that's voucher schools, and the light blue is charter schools, and this is percentage of bilingual schools in Milwaukee over time, starting with 1970 and going up to 2017, all right? So you can see here with the green line, there's this kind of steady growth in the percentage of bilingual schools bilingual public schools, right? And again, that's reflective of the activism and the success of bilingual public schools, right? Now, the voucher school starts really high in 1990, but that's because there was one bilingual voucher school out of seven altogether, you know? So there weren't many voucher schools when the program first started, but we can see it drops off precipitously, right? Even as the number of voucher schools mushrooms, all right? And with charters, there's been very few, okay? Where I used to work was one of the only bilingual charter schools uh, and, and it, it's remained one of the only bilingual charter schools. So you can see this disparity right, between bilingual public schools and very few uh, bilingual charter and voucher schools, all right? This is a, a map of the near south side, so a, a lot of where the activism for bilingual education took place, a place where there's a lot of Latinx families, a lot of Spanish-speaking families, um, and so what we can see here in terms of uh, the growth of schools, the new schools between 2013 and 2017 that opened have this kind of white uh, shadow behind them. All of them are English only or English medium schools and all of them are voucher and charter schools, okay? so. Um, when we look at, you know, these uh, green circles, those are the bilingual public schools, but we see this growth of English-only charter and voucher schools in the same neighborhoods, opening in close proximity to uh, bilingual public schools, right? And this can be problematic, especially with the ways that uh, charter and voucher schools promote their programs. So this is um, one uh, example from the website of a national charter chain. And this is what uh, I have called with a colleague Spanish adornment. So the, the school um, has its core values, right? It has five core values. And so it says responsibility, respect, empathy, persistence, esfuerzo, meaning effort right, in Spanish for effort. It has another chain and it, you know, core values, responsibility, respect, empathy, persistence, innovation, right? Uh, the difference is the demographics, where the school is located, right? So this first one with the one Spanish word as a core value is located in a majority Latinx neighborhood. And this one down here with the five uh, Eng English core values is located in a majority African-American neighborhood, right? So we refer to this as adornment or this kind of superficial inclusion of the Spanish language, even though the instruction is in English, right? 
Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you know charter and voucher schools sell their programs, perhaps by including like naming a school in a Spanish word, but having instruction all in English, um, or having like a picture of a, a girl reading a, a book in Spanish on the website, but again, providing all instruction in English. So there's some, um, some problematic ways that the, uh, the charter and voucher schools are marketing their programs. Um, real quickly, just main takeaways from this. I, I hope that you um, can appreciate the legacy of the movement to launch bilingual education and expand bilingual education in the city. Uh, I wouldn't have a job if it weren't for the, the, the movement, right? There would not be a, a, a position at UW-Whitewater UW uh, for bilingual education if there wasn't this Latinx-led movement for bilingual education in Milwaukee. It was unique. It represented this kind of community organizing for self-determination and it was um, really uh, powerful, and there were some important allies who contributed to that work, all right? So I, I'll leave it there, uh, and I'm uh, curious, you know, in terms of implications for Whitewater, how might you see this work informing teacher preparation at Whitewater or educational policy at Whitewater or, or even um, the actions of residents and citizens of Whitewater. I live in Milwaukee, but um, what might this mean for uh, you all who, who live here? Are there any actions you might take um, after kind of engaging with these stories? So I'm gonna leave it at that and see if we have time for uh, question and answer, but thank you so much for being here. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you.